the notion of sh that, that the space is shared, I think, is so important because um, in, in Hartford, like many cities, the downtown, we've defined it in, in our sort of outreach as the shared living room for the whole city. In other words, neighborhoods have their own parks and they have their own hangouts, but we think it's an appropriate model for Hartford that the downtown is the place where everybody gets to hang out, belongs to everyone. So that sense of sharing it uh, and really opening up to everyone, the Kanish theory, is, is great. And I think, um, I think this city doesn't really have that tradition of, of welcoming and, and opening up public space. I draw a little bit, and I draw an interesting, an, an additional conclusion in terms of what we've been doing here uh, on the, with the IQO partnership for the last seven years. I think we had the wrong terms. I mean, yeah, we, we do tend to use jargony terms. We, we'll, we'll, we'll really work on avoiding it. But we had this uh, a kind of strategy, which was to externalize your assets. We talked to all the cultural institutions. Because we have these big, not informal institutions, very formal institutions with formal buildings, with classical columns and entry sequences and staircases. And that can be quite intimidating to people who don't know, who aren't, who didn't grow up going to museums. Those can be barriers to, to the art. So they're very, they've been very formal. We said externalize your assets. You've got great stuff. You've got art. You've got music, theater, performance, dance. But people don't know. It's Hartford tends to hide its assets inside behind rather intimidating buildings. You've made me see that that's not enough. It's not enough to externalize the assets. Yet it's, it's going further. It's actually engaging. Yeah, sorry, I can't even say engaging. See, I fell into the <laughs> trap. How do we, it's, it's just welcoming people, it's getting them involved, it's making them feel like they're, it's for them, it's by them, that sense of participation. So it's a real challenge, I think, to our wonderful arts institutions here to go even further. Having an outside presence is good because it signals come on in, but it's got to be, it's actually moving the institution outside as much as possible. And, and I think you have to just really believe that you want everyone there and not just say it. And I mean, that's why I tell the Kanish story. I mean, my team will tell you I was obsessed with this. Like, you know, we had lots and lots of people coming to the island, and that was great because, again, if you know the sort of geography of New York, um, the Hasidic community tends to stay in their own community. And so the fact that they were doing all the same things, and it's amazing to watch. You'd have women in Shador, you'd have Hasidic families, but they couldn't eat. You know, and, and this made me insane. Mm. And so, I mean, this was a multi-year quest for a Kanish. Um, <laughs> But it was also that, in my quest, that was also signaling to everyone who worked on the island what it meant to be welcoming. And we had an episode that I won't go into, but it was an episode involving two of our visitors that almost became a very charged episode. And I had a security guard who gets paid you know, $15 an hour who diffused that episode because it is instilled in our culture you know, everyone is welcome. We are, you know, so mm. we didn't call the 911. We're gonna, you know, and, and I happened to have an elected official who watched it and called me to tell me about it and praise kind of our diversity and our attitudes. So that's what mm -hmm. I mean. It's like not just the fun stuff, but it really is. And I will tell you, I go, and I'm not gonna use a Hartford example. Um, I go into places and I can tell you how I, as a upper class, middle-aged white woman, don't feel totally welcome. And I don't mean discriminated against. I mean that the place is not welcome, it's intimidating. And then I think, well, what would it be like if I were a 16-year-old of whatever race, or I didn't speak English perfectly? And, and just every place you walk into, um, you can find ways that you can be more welcoming to people um, and, that, and feel really comfortable and excited that you are sharing whoever you are, whatever institution you are responsible for, are sharing that experience. Because that's what, I mean, I'm a little D, I'm a big D Democrat too, but that's what democracy is about. And that's what's going, you know, when you look at some of the conversation going on in our country right now, we are a country founded on diversity. And that metaphor of the shared living room is a beautiful metaphor, and that's why we use shared space. What does it mean for a space truly to be shared? And, and the other thing I'll say is when I started in this job, I mentioned that people, you know, I wondered if I was crazy, but the biggest problem we had, of course, was that nobody lives there, so there are no constituents, and we're publicly funded, right? So that seemed like, you know, sort of dead in the water. But what's happened is because nobody lives there, everybody shares it, right? And so everybody's equal. And you don't have the turf and the sort of, this is my park and the evil eye, you know, from the, 
this, you know, these mothers looking at, and that has really uh, been incredible, and the, the shared boat experience really accentuates that, but that's been incredibly important to that feeling, and now there's a whole city that really has equity in this very odd place. I mean, yeah, that's what I tell people about other cities. Like, if you can turn an abandoned island that nobody can sleep there into a shared place that people have so much emotion about, you know, any place can become sort of the love center of a community. 